chief of the Sustainable Urban Development Section for the Environment and Development Division of the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. He works with governments uh, to localize the sustainable development goals and promote sustainable solutions in cities throughout the Asia-Pacific Asia regions. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind invitation. Uh, only on our debating before this session started, who was going to go first? I think actually I lost because it's going to be hard to follow the presentation um, very well. But uh, what I'm going to do today is, is, is introduce to you a, a project and some initiatives that SCAP has been working on, uh, really looking specifically at uh, plastics. But first, let me introduce uh, what SCAP is it's the Economic and Social Commission. For Asia Pacific, where they are, we are the regional development arm of the United Nations. We're headquartered in Bangkok, but we have four sub regional offices one in Delhi, one in Almaty, Kazakhstan, one in Incheon, and one in Fiji. Uh, we have 53 permanent members and nine associate members. We span the largest uh, geographic area of all of their regional commissions in Turkey and Tonga. Um, much of our mandate is uh, implementing the Global Development Agenda, so the 2030 Agenda, the Paris Climate Agreement, um, and the New Urban Agenda, and others. And we provide, uh, through our platforms, policy dialogue, technical assistance, um, uh, technical cooperation, capacity building to national and uh, subnational governments. And we facilitate this regional cooperation through the platform of SCAP. I mentioned the, the 2030 Agenda, and I think most of you are familiar with the, the Sustainable Development Goals. There are sort of 17 different but interrelated goals that, that really uh, emphasize integrated solutions. Um, when we talk about cities and the SDGs, um, we say that cities really are the locations where all of the SDGs intersect. And you can identify either actions for each of those SDGs that need to be implemented, implemented in cities, or you can start to, to categorize the way that cities operate on a daily basis. Uh, so while there is one SDG on sustainable cities, uh, you can actually begin to disaggregate uh, the way that cities operate and the way that they focus on infrastructure and housing and basic services, on the environment and resources and focus on resilience, equity and equality and partnerships and start to categorize each of the SDGs according to the way that cities operate. And then in the three pillars of sustainable development, as previously mentioned, you can identify those interrelationships and, and, and start to foster integrated policies. I want to focus a little bit on the challenges of, of cities specifically in Asia and the Pacific region. It is one of the most rapidly urbanizing areas world. Half of the region's population is already urban. That represents 60% of the global urban population. And a lot of that population is located in vulnerable areas. Um, cities, as you know, generate um, 75, sometimes 80% of emissions uh, accounted to each country, but also globally they, they uh, have disproportionate emission shares. Uh, many of the cities in our region have weak urban planning or no urban planning. Uh, many of them have relied for long periods of time on central uh, government decisions. Uh, there hasn't been the devolution of authority down to the local level where planning makes the most sense. And so they can't provide the basic services or meet infrastructure needs. The population is growing faster than infrastructure improvements uh, can be built and there's a significant funding gap to address those infrastructure gaps. 19 of the top 20 most polluted cities in the world are Asia, and it goes on and on, uh, waste being just one of the issues. Um, just one chart, you can see the disproportionate influence of Asian Pacific cities. This is the urban population in mid-year, and the black line represents the Asian Pacific region, and the projections going forward towards 2050 indicate that that disproportionate um, level of development and population in Asian Pacific cities will continue. That leads to 
also a disproportionate share of material consumption uh, throughout the region. So the purple um, line, purple lines on these graphs represent the Asia Pacific region. And you can see that the growth from 1970 to 2010 um, far outweighs the growth in any of the other regions. You might think that this is actually happening in the largest cities, the mega cities within the region, but actually um, the predominance and the, the, what we call the unrecognized privacy is in the secondary cities. And you can see again in Asia that uh, cities of populations of less than 500,000 actually uh, represent most of the population in this region. This is important because these are also the cities that uh, traditionally have relied on intergovernmental transfers um, to make their improvements and to operate their, their local authorities. They've been the cities that don't have access to their own sources of revenue primarily. They don't have access to financial capital. Uh, they don't have access to the capital markets in, in, in that respect. And they don't access international finance quite well. So the challenges of even addressing many of the issues that we've talked about in these cities um, is significant. So we wanted to focus on, on one particular uh, challenge that, that uh, is really, again, also disproportionate in this region, and that is the challenge of plastic waste. So we developed a project called Closing the Loop, and the idea was to look at uh, plastic waste in the region is becoming a much more significant issue uh, to member states in the Asia Pacific, partly because it is also affecting marine economies. Um, Eight million tons of, of plastic uh, leaks into the oceans. Uh, more than 60% of plastic, that, plastic waste that leaks into the Pacific Ocean comes primarily from only five um, countries in this region. So this has uh, a significant impact, not just in the, in the solid waste management policies of these respective countries and cities, but also uh, affecting the region and potentially the economies. The first step was really to understand the materials. Um, we think of plastic, but everybody knows there are lots of different types of plastic. Um, and they, they vary by market. So we need to understand what was in the market and what is marketable. Uh, what are the technical solutions for each of those different types of plastics? Uh, and what are the solutions and what are the production alternatives? Um, is it possible to facilitate solutions that will reduce uh, the impact of plastics? Uh, following that, we looked at mapping of waste flows. So here you see kind of a flow chart of, of just plastic waste management in Bangkok. We'll come back to this. But uh, the Light colored, uh, beige color is essentially informal actors. Uh, the greens are the semi formal, and uh, the grays are the, the, the formal actors. But we needed to understand who is doing what and where. Uh, and where are the intersections between the informal and the formal sector? And I'll come to why we focus on the informal sector uh, shortly. But Oftentimes, we talk about here are the flows of, of waste, here is the volume that cities and, and countries are dealing with, but that often doesn't take into account the large amount of volume that is already addressed and converted by the informal sector. So if we had that data, those numbers would actually be far more significant. And then looking at how do you quantify the value of, of that conversion uh, and the savings to local authorities and in solid waste management uh, processes. Despite any efforts, there are always plastic leakages, and we need to know where that is happening as well, whether it's happening at the, at the site uh, of disposal, where it's happening at transfer stations, or if it's happening simply because the product or the material itself has no further market value in the current system, and then how do we change that system? Why well, focus on the informal sector and informal workers? Um, obviously, in our particular region here, uh, there is a large share of the labor force working in the informal sector. This isn't just in the waste sector, but it is generally uh, in the informal sector. Almost as high as 90% is in the informal sector in some, in some countries. So it's important to really engage with that. 
and with those stakeholders in the development of effective policies. If we are to come back to the implementing and achieving the SDGs, we can identify areas where the informal sector actually contributes significantly to the attainment of those targets. Uh, while more than 15 million people globally earn their income informally in the, sec in the waste sector, um, it's not just the waste sector that has um, a, 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 an impact from, from, that, from their work. Uh, it's almost every SDG that you can say, either plastic recycling that they're doing, facilitating plastic recycling as impacts on decent work, uh, no poverty, um, education, gender equality, and the list goes on and on. Uh, and in some cases, in some low-income countries, it's important to note that waste pickers are responsible or accountable, not responsible but accountable for uh, collecting between half and all of waste at no cost to municipalities. So we need to factor in, again, that value uh, and educate and make aware of the government authorities on the value of, of that work. So the project really looked at generating evidence in these pilot cities. And then we looked with, at Pune, India, and Bangkok, and uh, tried to work with uh, different stakeholders in those two um, locations. Um, we worked with the Stockholm Environment Institute, a trade, uh, informal trade union in um, India, uh, informal waste pickers in, in both locations, and tried to, again, bring all of this different information together. What are the flows? Where is the product? Who's doing what? Where are the intersection points? And it's those intersection points that aren't just areas where we can increase the volume of plastic that is produced. Is where we can actually increase the economic uh, impact for the informal workers. So understanding both the material flow and the social impacts is important. Uh, we looked at uh, what are the different collecting, sorting, scrap shops, recycling, and what are the challenges and the opportunities to improve the process. And actually, in a presentation this morning, Bella uh, Fonte actually stole a lot of what I was going to say, so you've heard it before, and I won't dwell on it. Uh, but it was important to, to look at these inclusive solutions and building the partnerships in order to recreate, increase the three R's and reduce the plastic uh, leakage. So in Pune, uh, they've had for a number of years now a cooperative and a, and a waste collection mechanism uh, where uh, waste pickers uh, collect from about uh, 300 households uh, per day. Um, Individually, they can collect between 10 and 15 kilos per person. Uh, if they had a tricycle or, or a, a motorized device, they could collect up to 50 kilos. And it's interesting that um, the, the geographic distribution and, and the, the area that can be focused on really does relate not just to the informal and the formal, but the transport systems upon which they rely. It's easy to say that in the formal system, all you know, there's much, lot, lots of these garbage trucks just going around picking up everything. That's actually not the way that cities work. It's not the way that communities or neighborhoods work. And it's not the way that households generate their waste. So much uh, more smaller scale systems uh, are, are, in reality, far more effective in many cases than the formal system. And I would say, if we're talking about broader issue of urban resilience, that the informal sector is often far more resilient than the formal sector because they don't rely on um, transportation systems or refrigeration or uh, lots of technology. They, they adapt to the conditions and the circumstances uh, that they face. So, um, and, and it's clear, obviously, uh, when you're dealing with the informal sector, that they collect and market what they can sell. So it was important to also characterize the types of different plastic. You see the, the greens represented in this table are those types of plastics that are easily marketable and there are daily prices established. The yellows are the more difficult ones and the reds don't yet have uh, recycling opportunities. But I think this is an important uh, point to stop because 
we focus on the cost and focus on the materials. And we say that you know, there needs to be investment in this and that. And, you know, and, and the burdens of picking up trash have all of these costs. Really, we need to focus also on investment where it's difficult to address materials or waste. So it's not to say that there's never going to be a solution for those in red, or it's always going to be difficult for yellow. Sometimes the responsibility of a system or of a local or national authorities is to invest in the innovations to address those challenges, rather than continue to see them as burdens. So understanding this waste character characterization and what is marketable today could lead to different solutions in the future. And that has both economic uh, implications in terms of cost savings for the cities who have to pick up the currently unrecyclables. It also has implications potentially for the informal who could access more and more markets as innovative solutions come to bear. So this, these are just some graphics uh, that we've developed in the project for um, Pune. Uh, it was interesting to note some of the some of the statistics. Uh, 87, only 80, roughly 90 percent of Pune's total municipal waste is collected, um, and half of the waste is collected by the informal sector. And again, if you think simply about the costs of collecting, um, some municipalities actually spend 40 to 60 percent of their municipal budgets on waste collection. So if you start to factor in some of these, these economic impacts and cost savings to cities, it begins to add up very quickly. Um, it also contributes to other national development strategies, whether it be a climate change strategy or nationally determined contributions to the Paris Agreement, that these things can start to be uh, quantified and reported uh, and actually accelerated and increased to a much larger scale. So uh, 50,000 tons of annual CO2 emissions simply because of what the informal sector is currently doing. Uh, the impact on the number of people, including who are, uh, are part of the trade union and negotiate with uh, the municipality and with the formal waste uh, system to increase and try to increase the market value of products uh, is important. And then the way that these um, different stakeholders interact. Um, so there are not just uh, the large recycling facilities and the transfer stations, but there are small and medium scrap shops that are intermediate points in the flow of materials uh, provided by the informal. And they also are often not considered or accounted in the solid waste management data that is readily available by city, or two cities or national governments. And then, the, the transformation of those products into uh, either materials for new products or recycled into new products are also opportunities uh, for the stakeholders. Despite that, there are still uh, leakages, both from illegal dumping and proper storage are collected. Uh, and again, uh, a lot of that is based simply on the, the inability to access particular markets. So we've developed a number of, of key uh, actions that have been shared with, with the city. Um, there are some, and you've heard them uh, in other presentations, some about uh, banning uh, policy bans, some about uh, establishing greater values for difficult to recycle plastics, some about fostering or facilitating innovation uh, and investment in industries that could uh, develop further solutions. In Bangkok, we looked at uh, one of the three waste disposal stations uh, and essentially mapped the same type of process. Uh, the numbers are, are a bit different, but the overall impact uh, is about the same. Bangkok, the informal sector, is not as well organized as Pune is. They don't have a trade union. Um, and in many of the countries in Southeast Asia, and particularly, uh, there are more and more efforts to actually exclude the informal sector and impose regulations on who can collect waste. 
this is where some of the different interests between informal and formal begin to conflict and cry, uh, whether it be incinerators or waste to, to energy providers, or whether it be the formal um, waste companies that are, that are on contract. Uh, many of them are pushing for more and more uh, regulations uh, to take out um, the impacts or discount to uh, what the informal sector can do. So this, uh, we also mapped here again, and this is a slide that I showed earlier, uh, but this is the plastic waste flow in Bangkok uh, and looking at the different stages. So the, what are the sources, whether it's from residential, institutional, or businesses, what are the current collection spots? And it's interesting um, to see that there's, you know, there's what you would typically expect in cities, the municipal garbage collection crews. But then there are um, residents, street waste pickers, itinerant waste uh, buyers, and waste collectors all in the informal. So in many respects, the number of informal stakeholders um, outweighs uh, the number of formal stakeholders. And that goes through the, through the uh, entire chain. So we have, we've developed a kind of a regional policy guide um, to, to take some of the learnings from this project forward and share it with other cities uh, and national governments. And um, you know, essentially, um, there are different types of recommendations, some on policy, some on better practices, some on research and collection of more data partly to make uh, aware uh, the impact of the informal and the potential cost savings to cities uh, and to foster regional cooperation. Uh, we looked uh, essentially at you know, some broader categories, uh, including what are the production processes that either could change, uh, could use different uh, you know, raw materials, or bring in different um, you know, recyclables into a more circular economy approach. Uh, and the EPR that uh, was mentioned in the, in the previous uh, segment, various tax incentives, voluntary agreements, um, and uh, bans, fees, tax incentives, reward schemes, coupon schemes, all of which have been uh, discussed. So I would encourage you, if you're interested, to look at this regional policy guide. It is up on our website and it kind of uh, synthesizes. Uh, much of the work that's being done in the region uh, to address 